NBC University Theater, bringing you a full-hour dramatization of The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, starring Brian Ahern. Today, a story by one of the most exciting writers of the last century, Joseph Conrad. He knew wherever he wrote, for he had been there. He was born in Poland. At 17, was a sailor of France, and not many years later, was a master mariner of the seven seas. He knew the world and its wickedness, and put both down on paper with great zest. Conrad is known as an English novelist, but he drew his imagery from the richness of three languages. The Heart of Darkness is one of his most masterful stories, drawing heavily on personal experience in the Congo. Its hypnotic style and intensity of mood have been well captured in today's adaptation for radio by Morton Friedman. Here, then, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, starring one of Hollywood's most articulate gentlemen, Mr. Brian Ahern, as Marlowe. We are well separated, Kurt and I. We are separated by life and death. I live, and Kurt does not. We are separated by a year. Exactly one year ago, I saw his body swallowed by the mud of a river bank in Africa. We are separated by thousands of miles. We are well separated, Kurt and I. And yet, less than an hour ago... I saw him again, and again I heard him, his magnificent voice, whispering, pealing, proclaiming, begging, and again I heard the beat of the drums, regular and muffled like the beating of a heart, the heart of a conquering darkness. I trust you will pardon this uh, intrusion, Mademoiselle Marlowe, but I have come to see Captain Marlowe on business, uh, company business. Oh, dear, how awkward. I'm afraid you can't see my nephew, monsieur. Can't? Uh, I mean now. Uh, he, um, uh, I believe he's taking a nap. Just I must insist, Mademoiselle, upon seeing your nephew, the Captain, now. He is involved in a matter of the utmost gravity. The company is quite perturbed. But if he's napping, I can't wake him. That won't be necessary. He is awake. There is a light in his room, the corner room. Well, really now. Uh, you smell it? Tobacco. The captain is smoking. I'll tell him you're here, if he's awake. Charlie. I'm awake, Artie. Um, the director of the company. I know, I heard you talking. Tell him to go away. I don't want to see him. Charlie, don't you think you ought to get it over and done with? <clears throat> you know... <clears throat> I I coughed twice. You both were so engrossed, uh, I'm afraid you didn't hear. Monsieur Director. Uh, I'm so very glad to see you, Capitaine. You can't imagine how anxiously I have looked forward to seeing you again. And to talk to me, Monsieur Director, to ask some questions, Monsieur Director... Some questions about Kurtz. Ah, I see you are an intelligent man, Capitaine. I am pleased. Oh, can't we dispense with the sham? You're not here as a friend, but as a representative of the company. Say rather both. As a friend and as a representative, as you put it, of the company. Both. If you don't mind, I think I'd like to go to my room. I think that's wise, Auntie. Oh, there is no real need for you to go, Mademoiselle. Whatever we have to say, your nephew and I... I sure. think I shall be able to like you both better if I don't hear what you have to say to each other. Perhaps. Who knows? Uh, uh, now, Capitaine, about uh, <clears throat> Kurtz. Uh, shortly before this uh, uh, unfortunate death, uh, Mr. Kurtz gave you a package containing some papers of his, uh, did he not? Some papers and a photograph. In a shoebox. Oh, you still have them. Where are they? Uh, let me have them. I still have them. I have them with me. And I will not let you have them. 
I, I beg your pardon. I meant to say, if you had them, might I see the documents Kurtz left in your care? Look here, when the manager of the central station told you I had the documents, he must also have told you that he tried to get them and couldn't. He did so report. And what makes you think I would change my mind because you asked me? Because they concern company territory, very valuable territory, a completely unexplored portion of the Congo until Mr. They Kurt... have nothing in them in reference to commerce. They're all purely personal. There may be much of great value to science, uh, geographers, anthropologists... Not very much if you're concerned with any values or any other profit than to yourself and the company. I confess I do not understand your obvious hostility... But you would do well to be civil. Oh, you're being ridiculous. After all, you insulted me first. You insulted my intelligence with your prattle about science. I do not make idle threats, Captain Marlowe. So believe me, I shall... You'll do nothing. Remember Kurtz's papers? <laughs> there may be lots of profits in them. And I've got them, Remember? <laughs> uh, let's be sensible. Uh, what do you want for those papers? Um... How much? Oh, so that they may be used for the promotion of science, of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> How much? I'll match your generosity, monsieur. Take it. For science. Free. Hmm. Here, this little pamphlet on the bed table. Uh, this? Uh, this is it? Uh, been in front of me all this time? Right. A report written by Mr. Kurtz entitled The Suppression of Savage Customs. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, nothing. This is Nothing. Not at all what I expected. Keep it! Two days later, I had another caller. A man who said he was Kurtz's cousin. This uh, self-identified cousin was a musician. Yes, yes, a musician, an organist. I have studied music for years. But did you know, sir, that my cousin Kurtz was essentially a great musician? No, I didn't. Plain truth, I couldn't tell what Kurtz's real profession was. He painted well, wrote well. I couldn't tell which of his many talents was the greatest. Oh, yes, 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 you are quite right, sir. Yes, quite right. My cousin Kurtz was undoubtedly a universal genius. I agreed with the old chap. Kurtz undoubtedly was just that. Well, he left after a while, taking with him some family letters that had been among Kurtz's papers. Couldn't I be done with it all? I wanted to forget, to wipe my mind and memory clear of Kurtz, and the horror, to use his own word, that was inextricably associated with him in my mind. The horror and the darkness and the death. But mostly the darkness. <laughs> Another caller. This time, a journalist, a self-proclaimed colleague of Kurtz. Ah, you should have heard him address large meetings. He could electrify them. He had the faith. Faith? Faith in what? Anything. Kurtz could get himself to believe in anything. And anything he believed in, he could get anyone to believe. Ah, he would have had a great career in politics. What a splendid leader of a party he would have been. What party, for example? Any party. So long as it was an extreme party. He was himself an extremist, don't you agree? I evaded the answer, or rather the true answer, and gave him instead Kurtz's pamphlet. The journalist took it most eagerly and left with it, saying it would be published at once. So now I am left with a slim packet of letters and the girl's photograph. All that had been Kurtz's, save these, have passed through my hands. His soul, his body, his station, his plans, his ivory, his career. There remains only his memory and his intended. I have gone to see Kurtz's intended, the girl of the photograph, to return the letters and the picture, to surrender to his memory, and to wipe my memory clear of all that oppresses it and me. We sit in the formal drawing room of her house. We sit and talk, sporadically. She is still in deep mourning, although a year has now passed since his death. You knew him. You knew him well, didn't you? 
Uh, I, uh, I knew him as well as well as it is possible for one man to know another. And you admired him. Oh, it was impossible to know him and not to admire him, wasn't it? He was a uh, uh, remarkable man. Uh, as you, uh, as you say, it was impossible not to, not to love uh, him. Oh, how true! How true! She talks about Kurtz. I hardly listen. For her words in the twilight gloom have conjured up for me again a vision of the man. I see him again, and only occasionally hear snatches of her voice as it pierces the phantom that besets my mind and my eyes. He drew men towards him by what was best in them. Oh, it is the gift of the great, and he had it. It's unbearable, the burden of observing her grief. A noble grief that comes from her core with nothing of pose or convention in it. And at the end, he whose goodness shone in his every act, he died as he lived. His end was, uh, in every way, uh, worthy of his life. And I was not with him. No one near him who understood. I was with him. To the very end. To the very end. Oh, please... Please, his last words to live with. Don't you understand? I loved him. I loved him. She is begging. With her eyes and her heart in her eyes, she's begging. Making the silence clamorous with the begging words she restrains, refusing to give them utterance. I cannot... Answer. Oh, please. His. Just his last words. Just tell me his last words. She bows to my silence. She sits, immobile, grave. She has long since learned to accept silence and to bear. And I sit, and I cannot reply. I cannot tell her of the last, for I am caught up once more in the beginning. In the silence, it begins again, from the beginning, almost two years ago. Thirty days from the port in Europe to the coastal station of the company in Africa, the station where I first heard of Kurtz. Your boat, Captain Marlowe, is at the central station, 200 miles up the river. Oh, then I should be on my way there. You shall have to walk. What, 200 miles? Yes, I know it sounds ridiculous, but everything here in this foul country is ridiculous. Or fatal, or both. And you shall leave with the next caravan for the central station. As I said, that will be in ten days. Uh, maybe longer. The caravan will leave the day after tomorrow, Captain. Oh, I can't say I'll be sorry to leave. Uh, you have one interesting prospect. In the Ontario, you will no doubt meet Monsieur Kurtz. And who is this interesting Mr. Kurtz? Oh, oh believe me, Captain. Monsieur Kurtz is a remarkable person. A most unusual man. Oh, is he in charge of the central station? Oh, no, 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 no. He is much further out in the very bottom of the Congo. His trading post is in the true ivory country. He sends in as much ivory as all the others put together. Fifteen days after leaving the coastal station, I hobbled into the central station, where I was immediately taken into tow by a bearded young man who informed me that his name was Malapart. Ma Marlow? Captain Marlow. Oh, you are here to take charge of the boat, huh? To run the boat, too. Wherever it is, I'm supposed to run it. Ah, that's too bad, Captain. How are you to run a boat that is at this moment at the bottom of the river? Too bad. What? How did this happen? Oh, no, when? no, it's quite all right. I assure you, the manager himself was there. All is quite all right. All right? What? My boat sunk and you please, say it's please, all right? the manager what the will devil explain. You? He's, he's waiting. You must go see him at once. You're 
a very long time getting here, Captain Marlowe. The delays were beyond my control, Monsieur Renard. I could not wait. As manager of the central station, I'm responsible for the agents at the upriver stations. I had to start without you. But without a captain? Why, the risk to the boat was enormous. Are you questioning my judgment, Captain? Ah. There were rumors that a very important station is in danger. That its chief, Mr. Kurtz, is ill. I do hope the rumors are false. Mr. Kurtz is... I know all about Mr. Kurtz. Oh? Well, then, you can understand my anxiety. Tell me, Captain... How long will it take to get the boat off the bottom and repair it? Well, how the devil can I tell? I haven't even seen the wreck yet. Besides, I, I'm hungry and tired. I've walked 20 miles today, and I haven't eaten or sat down yet. Ah, oh, it probably will take months. Months? Yeah. Let's say three months. <laughs> that ought to do it perfectly. The next day, I began operations to raise the boat from the bottom. Fasten that stern line and keep bailing. Well, well. Well, Captain Marlowe, you're an example of industry. Eh? Oh, hello, Malapart. Keep those pumps working. You will be able to repair the boat. Oh, worry about that later. Right now, the problem is to get her on the bank to work on her. Well, of course, you know all about these things. Tell me, Captain, confidentially... What do you think about our manager, Renard? Hmm? Ooh, I haven't thought about him at all. Why? Oh, nothing, nothing. No reason, just curious. <laughs> I was wondering if you did not find it strange that one so obviously mediocre as he should be manager. I said I haven't thought about him at all. I must tell you, in confidence, of course, that I used to find it strange... When first I came out here. You're doing the talking, Malapath. I'll listen. <laughs> you are most discreet. <laughs> Very wise. However, do you know that I no longer find it strange that Renard is manager? He is manager because he is never ill. He inherited his position. Think of it. Nine years out here. And never once ill. That's very interesting. So what? Oh, nothing, nothing. You know, you cannot imagine how many men have come here from Europe hoping to replace Renard as manager. And every one of them has failed. And do you know why? <laughs> it's of a magnificent simplicity, the answer. Renard outlives them. They die. Renard remains the manager. What are you getting at? Getting at? Oh, Captain Marlowe... <laughs> I'm amazed. One might think that you suspected me of giving you a warning. I suspected Malapart of something, but of what I didn't know. Certainly I couldn't credit the obvious inference that I'd come out to oust Renard from his job as manager. There were 18 or 19 other white men at the station besides Malapart who whiled away the time with backbiting and petty intrigue. And it was not long before I learned that Malapart was the manager's spy. He had indeed been warning me. But why? Why? I do hope you don't mind my coming aboard the boat, Captain Marlowe. Oh, you're aboard already. I brought something I thought might interest you. A uh, painting. It's small, but interesting, I think. Here. Look for yourself. Oh, subject's interesting. Native girl holding a torch, looks like. Hey, that's not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> who painted it? Mr. Kurtz. Huh. Tell me, who is this Mr. Kurtz? The chief of the inner station. <laughs> Much obliged. And you are the manager's spy. Everybody knows that, too. <laughs> Come, talk. Kurtz is a prodigy. Today he is chief of the best station. Next he will be assistant manager. In a year or two... <laughs> but I dare say you know what he'll be by then. You are of the new gang. I know. You know? Uh. 
<laughs> Malapart, you've been reading the company's confidential correspondence. <laughs> Ah, uh, when Mr. Kurtz is general manager, you won't have the opportunity. <laughs> the last repairs were being made on the steamboat when the station was invaded by a mob of pack animals, porters, and white men, calling themselves the El Dorado Exploring Expedition. The uncle of our manager, Renard, was the leader. I found them so distasteful that to contain my temper, I took to staying aboard my steamboat. Well, the evening before the expedition left, I was stretched out on the deck when I heard the voices of the manager and his uncle on the bank against which the boat lay. I know I'm the manager. But I was ordered to send him there. Ordered? It is unpleasant, but the man has great influence. Influence enough to jeopardize my position and yours, my dear uncle. Hmm. Is he alone there? Yes. Sent his assistant down the river with a note to me. I remember it word for word. Clear this poor devil out of the country and don't bother sending more of this sort. I'd rather be alone than have the kind of men you can dispose of with me. That's the note he sent me, the manager, me. Anything since then? Ivory. Lots of it. Prime stuff. Lots. But How? He's been without supplies for over nine months now. No goods, no stores. Uh, perhaps some wandering white man who gets ivory from the natives. Well, perhaps the climate will do away with your problem, Renard. Yes, I know that. Don't worry, then. Trust to the jungle, the river, the fever, the savages. Trust to this. And your magnificent health. You stand the climate. You are blast them all. And at the worst, here, anything can be done. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Brian Ahern in a radio version of Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. This play is part of a series devoted to the classic novels of Anglo-American literature. If you're interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And now, our intermission commentator, Mr. Granville Hicks, author of The Great Tradition, Small Town and John Reed, The Making of a Revolutionary. Speaking from New York, here is Mr. Granville Hicks. The process by which Joseph Conrad became a master of English fiction was as full of coincidences as one of Thomas Hardy's novels. In the first place, he was not a native Englishman, and in the second place, he chose for himself a career that was far removed from literature. He was born in Poland in 1857, and when he was 17, he went to France to become a sailor, in itself a surprising decision for a youth who had grown up in an inland country. In 1878, quite by accident, he signed on a British ship. This led to other voyages under the British flag, and eventually to his becoming a British citizen. While he was recuperating from a fever contracted in Africa, he began his first novel. He intended to return to the sea, but his health had been impaired. The periods between voyages grew longer. He finished his first novel and began another. And so, without conscious intention, he drifted into the literary career that was to last until his death in 1924 and was so full of distinction. Like Herman Melville, Conrad based most of his novels on personal experience, and his most inspiring experiences, like Melville's, were associated with the sea. Heart of Darkness, of course, is not a sea story. But so far as the setting goes, it is autobiographical. Conrad did go to the Congo. The diary that he kept on that trip makes no mention of a Mr. Kurtz, but it demonstrates that he knew at first hand of the Heart of Darkness. In a passage that has often been quoted, Conrad wrote, My task which I am trying to achieve is, by the power of the written word, to make you hear... To make you feel, it is, before all, to make you see. 
the reader of Heart of Darkness does see the Congo and the impenetrable African jungles, but feeling is for once more important than seeing. What makes the story great is the overwhelming power with which Conrad creates a mood, a mood of terrified anticipation and realized horror. But there is something more in this tale than the evocation of a barbaric continent. Where is the heart of darkness anyway? In Africa or in Mr. Kurtz? That is to say, in man. Today, after what we have known of concentration camps and human slaughterhouses, the story has a new meaning. Where does Kurtz's ambition lead for all his idealistic professions? To participation in obscene rites and to that devastating postscript to his official report, exterminate the brutes. It is in more senses than one that we can say that Conrad knew the heart of darkness. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Our radio version of The Heart of Darkness, starring Brian Ahern, will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. expedition plunged into the patient wilderness the next day, and nine days later, the stern wheel of the steamboat began to churn the treacherous waters of the river and started upstream. It was two months of the day when we came to the bank below Kurtz's station. It was like a particularly torturous dream, that journey. The sort of dream one recognizes in the dreaming as a dream, and yet is unable to escape by awakening. A great silence enveloped us. And all about us, over us, beside us, beneath us, was darkness. Ever darker as we penetrated further, until it seemed that we would soon be within the very heart of darkness. Trees, millions of trees. Massive, immense, running up very high. And at their foot, hugging the bank, puffing feebly against the stream, crept the little steamboat, like a small beetle crawling on the floor of a lofty portico. Where Malapart and his fellow seekers of trading posts imagined it crawled to, I don't know. Some place where they expected to get something, I bet. But for me, it crawled toward Kurtz, exclusively. Some 50 miles below the inner station, the manager yelled up to me in the wheelhouse from the deck below. Captain! Captain Marlow! Look over to the right bank. A flag of some sort. Can you make it out? No. Shall we put it to shore and take a look? Yes. It may belong to one of our traders. Nice stack of wood all piled up. We can use it. Uh, that seems deserted. No signs of a struggle. Hello. Some message of some sort on that flat piece of board. Can you read it, Renan? Uh, not without my glasses. It's so faded. See what you can make of it. Hmm. It is faded. Uh, wood for you. Hurry up. Approach cautiously. Well, there's a signature, too, but it's too faded to make out. It's a foolish message. Hurry up. Where? Approach cautiously. Where? <laughs> Obviously not here. We weren't very cautious approaching. Idiot. Write some message as if we were writing a telegram. The devil with it. Let's load the wood aboard and get on our way. This looks like a good place to anchor for the night, Captain. According to my calculations, Renard, we're only eight miles from Kurtz's station. Let's keep going, eh? Oh, no. I'm afraid it would be too risky. Waters here are quite dangerous. Less than an hour of sunlight left. But we're so near. Besides, recall the message. Approach cautiously. Now. Now I think we'd best wait for morning. The 
manager was right. Eight miles meant three hours steaming for us, and the water had many suspicious ripples. It was sensible. Still, I was annoyed beyond expression at the delay. When the sun rose, there was a white fog, hot and clammy, more blinding than the night. It just lay there like something solid. At eight or nine, it lifted all at once like a shutter lifts. Oh! Well, thank heavens for that, Captain. I thought that fog was going to lay in all day. Ah, you spoke too soon, Renard. It's rolling down on us again. Forget it. Drop anchor. Drop anchor! What was that? Savage. Did you, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Mile apart. Get the others. Get your rifle, quickly. Cover all sides of the boat. Keep your rifles ready. Fire as soon as you see them. Finally, the fog lifted, and the boat headed into the western passage. It was narrower than it had seemed, and shallower. The deeper water was near to the bank. I ordered my steersman, an athletic-looking native whom I called Boy, or various of the more pungent names a sailor learns, to steer inshore, whilst I kept a sharp eye ahead for snags and rocks. Hard right, boy. Yeah, is, bueno. Hard, I said, blast you, hard. Yeah, is, bueno. Steady now, steady. I looked below me where I could see the fireman, and suddenly he stretched himself out, prone on the deck. I was amazed. But then I had to look at the river again mighty quick. There was a snag dead ahead. And sticks, little sticks were flying about, thick. Hard left, boy! Hard left! Arrows. The little sticks were arrows. We were being shot at. Native had left the wheel, grabbed the heavy rifle that was on the wall of the wheelhouse, opened the side shutter, and was shooting. I grabbed the whistle cord and jerked out screech after screech, while with the other hand I held the wheel. The whistle checked the tumult, and the attack ended as it began, abruptly. Boy, the steersman, was on the floor with what appeared to be a long cane sticking out of his back. It was the shaft of a spear that had pierced him through. He was gashed horribly. A pool of his blood gleamed dark red under the wheel. Captain! Captain, the manager wants you... Oh, no. Is... Is he dead? I suppose. Here, hold the wheel. But I can't. I don't know... Hold it, blast you. Just hold it steady. I reached over, shut my eyes, pulled the spear out of him, and put him over the side with a single movement. The greatest strain was on my stomach, not my strength, as I put my arms around that body. Marlow, good heavens, Marlow, you're not going to... What do you want to keep the body hanging about for? To embalm it? The manager and Malapart and the other whites were scandalized. And so was my crew, and for a better reason. Oh, I admit their reason was inadmissible... Besides, I had made up my mind that if my late steersman was to be eaten, it would be by fish only. There is really very little point in going ahead. These savages have surely burned the station to the ground. Most probably... Kurtz, too, then, is undoubtedly dead. Now, what do you want to do, then? Shall I turn the boat around and go back downstream? Oh, no, no, not at all. We must examine the remains. If we can, give poor Kurtz Christian burial. Marlow, fire does not always destroy ivory. The ivory he collected may still... The ivory... Ivory... I felt sick. I felt like crying. All I could think was I will never hear Kurt speak. I felt somehow as if I'd been robbed of a belief or had missed my destiny in life. I was gripped by the sense of tears in my being. 
I was mourning within me, for I'd lost the inestimable privilege of listening to the gifted Kurtz. At least we're safer here, Captain. Channel is well in midstream. Yeah, what's that up ahead? Uh, the station. It's Kurtz's station. What? Not burned. Here, hold the wheel, Renard. I want to take a look through my glasses. As I adjusted the glasses. A long, decaying building, perched on the summit of a naked hill, swung into focus. There was no stockade or fence around it. But apparently there had been one, for near the house half a dozen slim posts remained, roughly trimmed and ornamented on top with round carved balls. On the bank I saw a white man wearing a hat like a cartwheel, waving his arm in frantic circles. As we pulled in close to the shore, I could see him clearly. Ahoy! You're there ashore. Are we in time? Yes, I think so. He's up there in the house. We've been attacked. I know. I know. It's all right. Come ashore. It's all right. You stay here with the boat, Captain. The rest of you, come with me and bring your guns. manager and the rest of them went ashore, up to the hill and to the house. And the other chap came aboard. Uh, they are simple people, but I'm glad you've come. It, it took me all my time to keep them off. Oh? <laughs> they meant no harm. <laughs> that is not exactly... You see, you just can't tell when they mean harm or no harm. Or, or then again... <laughs> Such a rate he quite overwhelmed me. He seemed to be trying to make up for lots of silence. I, I, I'm afraid I'm talking too much, but I can't help myself. I've got so much talk bottled up in me. <laughs> Why, don't you talk with Mr. Kurtz? <laughs> we with Mr. Kurtz? <laughs> no, my friend, you don't talk with that man. Oh, you listen to him. And I tell you, this man has enlarged my mind. <laughs> Not just me, no. the natives too. <laughs> Not that I mean they have minds, but whatever it is they have, uh, he has captured it. Then why did they attack us? Oh, he, they don't want him to go. Oh, don't they? No. But you must take Kurtz away quick. Quick, I tell you. Uh, he, he is very badly off. Very badly. I have been doing my best to keep him alive. Calm yourself. I'm sure you've done very well. No, no, I have no abilities. And there isn't a drop of medicine or invalid food. There hasn't been for months. So shamefully abandoned. A man like this with such ideas is shameful. I I can't do any more. I, I haven't slept for the last ten nights. I... I gave him a tot from the brandy flask. Medicinal. After a bit, he began to talk again. His words were satellites revolving about the sun that was Kurtz. We hmm, met by accident in the jungle. And ever since you've been with him? Oh, no, no. Hardly ever, except twice when Kurtz was ill. Most of the time, he'd be wandering through the jungle looking for rivalry. But he's had no goods to trade for for well nigh a year now. <laughs> There's a good deal of cartridges left even yet. Oh. Let's speak plainly. You mean Kurtz raided the country? Yes. But he couldn't do it alone, surely. Well, they came from the villages around the lake. Kurtz got the tribe to follow him, did he? Well, you see, they adore him. <laughs> What can you expect? He came to them with thunder and lightning. And don't you see? They had never seen anything like it before. He was terrible. He could be very terrible. He sounds vile and horrible. No, no, no. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would an ordinary man. <laughs> If 
finally subsided into silence. I picked up my binoculars and looked more carefully than before at the fence that had once enclosed the house and at the round carved ball that ornamented the top of the pole. I felt my stomach drop. Quickly I examined the top piece on each of the poles. They were all the same. Not ornaments, not round carved wooden balls, but black dried human skulls. <laughs> yeah, he should have taken them down, but I didn't dare. <laughs> Not that I'm afraid of the natives, you understand. No, they wouldn't stir until Mr. Kurtz gave the word. He controlled them completely. <laughs> Why, when the chiefs of the tribes come to see Mr. Kurtz, they would call. Stop. I, I don't want to know anything about the ceremony of approaching Mr. Kurtz. No, don't judge him, Captain. You don't know how such a life tries a man like Kurtz. No? Well, then, how has it tried a man like you? Me? <laughs> what am I? <laughs> Simple man. I, I have no great thoughts. I want nothing from anybody. <laughs> how can you compare me to... Me, uh, nobody, uh, nothing. How can you compare me? We were silent, he and I. We watched the sudden tropic nightfall. It shadowed the house, and the shadows were lengthening down the hill toward the river, which still glittered with a dazzling splendor. Not a living soul was to be seen on the shore... Not a single bush rustled. Suddenly, around the corner of the house, a group of men appeared, bearing an improvised stretcher in their midst. And instantly, in the emptiness of the landscape, as if by enchantment, streams of human beings, naked human beings, seemed to rise from out the very ground to surround the group of men bearing the stretcher. If he doesn't say the right thing to the natives now, we are all done for. Well, let's hope that the man who can talk so convincingly will find some particular reason to do so and spare us this time. Oh, they're so far away. If only I could hear him. <laughs> He's done it. They've gone. Gone? They disappeared. I was watching, and they never moved, and they were gone. As if the jungle had drawn them back with a single enormous sucking breath. They brought Kurtz aboard and put him in the little cabin next to mine. We had brought along his mail, a year's worth of torn envelopes and open letters, now littered his bed. He waved one of the letters and, looking at me, spoke. I'm glad to see you, Captain. They write fine things about you. Gentlemen, would you leave us? Mr. Kurtz and I have some matters to discuss. Did I describe his voice truthfully, Captain? Huh? Did I? It's amazing. Such strength. And the sound of it. Why, he doesn't look strong enough to whisper. Hey, there's something on my heart. I... I, I feel you should know, yet if it were known, it would affect Mr. Kurtz's reputation gravely. He couldn't see that Kurtz was already as good as in his grave. To him, I suspect, Kurtz was one of the immortals. I don't want anything to happen to you or the others here, but I must consider Mr. Kurtz's reputation. All right, I promise you, Mr. Kurtz's reputation is safe with me. <laughs> or, uh, the attack on your steamboat. Mr. Kurtz ordered it. Eh? Huh? He had sometimes the idea of being taken away. And, and, and then again, I don't quite understand it. I, I am a simple man. That he, he thought it would scare you away, that you would give it up, thinking him dead. Oh, I have had an awful time of it this last month. Hmm. He's all right now, though, isn't he? Yes. Oh, thanks. I shall keep my eyes open. <laughs> and your promise, too. Keep that. As you would yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Captain. <laughs> Goodbye. Before I could quite catch the full significance of his goodbye, he was gone. And I never saw him again. I stood there in the darkness, 
And suddenly, like a clarion, Kurtz's voice rang out, although I was some considerable distance from the cabin where he and the manager, Renard, were closeted. Save me! Ha! Save the ivory, you mean. Don't tell me you've saved me. Why, I had to save you. Now you're interrupting my plans. Sick? Not as sick as you'd like to believe. Never mind. I'll carry my ideas out yet. I'll return. I'll show you what can be done. You and your little peddling notions. You're interfering with me. I'll return. It was well after midnight when I awoke. I don't know why I should have, but I did. I walked out of the pilot house onto the deck. On top of the hill, a big fire was burning. And around the fire were several of the boat's crew and Malapart, or one of the manager's other jackals, keeping guard over the enormous store of ivory that Kurtz had assembled. I turned away from the rail for a moment and glanced casually into the little cabin. A light was burning in it, but Kurtz was not there. <laughs> moment, I knew pure terror. Kurtz was going back. Back to the jungle. And once he reached the natives, he would order our massacre. He would never allow us to return to tell. I went ashore quickly, and as soon as I got on the bank, I saw a broad trail through the dew of grass. It was obvious. Kurtz was crawling on all fours. Too weak to walk. I ran rapidly, bent close to the ground, following the trail. And suddenly, so suddenly that I almost fell over him, I was upon him. Go away. Hide yourself. Come back to the boat. Quietly with me. I was on the threshold of great things. Now this stupid scoundrel, this Renard... It doesn't matter. Your success in Europe is assured in any event. I already have it here. Look there by the fire. See him? I looked. Not 30 yards away was a fire, and striding up and down before it, a black figure majestically erect... Wearing horns, antelope horns, I think, on its head. He is a witch doctor, a priest, and I... I am a god he worships, and all the rest of them, it is I... The love of your own, your family, the girl you're to marry, the awe and fear and respect of your own goods. Don't you want that? What more have I ever wanted? And yet... Your mind, Kurtz, your mind and your talents, your genius... Where can they receive proper recognition here? Who can appreciate them here? No one. And I am a great man. I am. It was a terrible contest. I couldn't appeal to him in the name of anything high or low. I had, even as the savages who worshipped him... To invoke him himself, his own exalted and terrible degradation. I struggled with him, and he struggled with himself too. I saw the inconceivable mystery of a soul that knew no restraint, no faith, and no fear, and yet struggled with itself blindly. I had to half carry him back on the boat. <laughs> The brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness, bearing us back with twice the speed of our journey into the jungle. And Kurtz's life was running swiftly, too, ebbing, ebbing out of his heart into the sea of inexorable time. And I saw it. For he was not in the little cabin, but in the pilot house, where there was more air. And Kurtz would talk, discourse abruptly, without preamble or explanation, much as a gramophone record blares out music from whatever spot the needle is put to it. Did you know, Captain Marlowe, that I have been commissioned by the International Society for the Suppression of Savage Customs to write a paper on the subject? Boy, I'm afraid I... No, know. of course not. I hadn't told you before. Now, well, here, Captain. Read it for yourself. I 
I read it. 17 pages of it. It was magnificent. It gave me the notion of an exotic immensity ruled by an august benevolence. It had, had unbounded eloquence, noble, burning words, but no practical suggestions to interrupt the magic current of phrases, unless a kind of note, scrawled evidently after the report proper had been written, that appeared at the foot of the last page. It was just this. Exterminate all the brutes. Why have we stopped, Captain? It's only mid-afternoon. Well, the engine's broken down. It'll be a few days before they're repaired, I'm afraid. Close the shutter! Jungler's looking in at me. Close it, please! All right, all right. Don't get excited, Kurtz. Can't bear to look at it. It laughs at me. It listens to me talking of my my ivory, my station, my river, my career, my intended. It listens and it laughs. It knows all these belong to me. It knows. But it laughs because it knows that I belong to its own infernal powers of darkness. I'm sold to it. I was bought by... Ah, never mind the vile purchase price. I know the price. And the jungle knows. Oh, come now, Kurt. Your nerves are getting a little low. Here, get some sleep. You'll feel better. No, now. Captain. It won't be too much longer. That much is plain. I know it. You can see it. There's a shoebox under my bed. Take care of it for me. It's got some private papers and my intended's photograph. That stinking fool Renard is capable of prying into my things, and I want you to see he does not. All right, all right. Please, would you mind leaving me alone for a bit? No, not at all. Not at all. I spent the rest of the day working on the engine. It was evening before I returned to the pilot house. Kurtz lay on his bed, staring straight ahead, unblinking, immobile. I'm lying here in the dark, waiting for death. Oh, stop talking nonsense, Kurtz. Why, there's a candle within a foot of your eyes. change came over his face, a change I hope never to see again. It was as if he achieved a supreme moment of complete knowledge, and in that moment lived again every detail, every temptation, and every surrender of his life. And he cried out twice. The horror. The horror. Pass the salt, please, Malaport. Here you are. Thank you. Salt, Captain? No, oh, no, it's all right as it is. Tell me, how is Kurtz tonight? Oh, all right, I guess. I think I should pop in, say hello to him. I'll ask him if he's ready for his dinner. Right, I'll do that. You know, but I'll get back to Europe, Captain. I'm going to find the man who sells us this tinned beef, and I'm going to shoot him. Why not torture him? Make him eat some of it. <laughs> That's very good, Captain. <laughs> That's very good. Good! He's dead. Oh. Come on. Let's see. Come in, Captain. No, I haven't finished my dinner. I didn't eat any more after they left. I hadn't gone because it was light in the dining room. And so beastly dark out there. And besides, the voice was gone. Kurtz's voice was gone forever. And what else had there ever been? Is 
Last words, please. Oh, you must tell me, Captain. Please, won't you? Won't you tell me his last words? Kurtz is intended. I had quite forgotten. I was in the drawing room of a house back in Europe. The house of Kurtz is intended. You've... You've been thinking of... Of him. Of Kurtz, haven't you? Uh, uh y- yes, yes, I... I Oh, forgive me. Most impolite. I, I understand. Uh, often I sit and I think of Kurtz. Remember him. Miss him. And never miss the hours that go by. Had I been remembering Kurtz for hours? I don't know. But the dusk is gone and night and darkness fill the room. Oh, you will. You will tell me, won't you? You will tell me his last words. Oh, you must. The, the last word he pronounced was your name. I I knew it. I was sure. I was so sure. So sure. I fled the room and the house. She was weeping. She didn't notice. I didn't matter. But I thought the house would collapse on me before I could escape. That the heavens would fall upon my head. For I had lied. Lied completely. I couldn't tell her the truth. I couldn't. It would have been too dark. Too dark altogether. University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas. The Heart of Darkness was adapted for radio by Martin Friedman. Our intermission commentator was Granville Hicks. The part of Marlowe was played by Brian Ahern, internationally celebrated star of stage and screen. Our cast included Rolf Sedan, Doris Lloyd, Tony Barrett, Lynn Allen, Roy Engel, Jerome Sheldon, Ben Wright, Whitfield Connor. Your announcer, Don Stanley. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Dr. Albert Harris, the director of the NBC University Theater, is Andrew C. Love. Next week, be with us again for the NBC University Theater dramatization of Edith Wharton's fine novel, The Age of Innocence, starring John Sutton. This program came to you from Hollywood's Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.